is the uh, VP of software development at Waves. He's also been writing device drivers and applications for desktop and embedded platforms for more than 25 years. Most of his work in the past decade has been audio, both professional and consumer. In addition, he also has vast experience writing system and application software for a variety of domains and technologies, including accounting, audiometry, communications, computer-aided design, desktop publishing, endoscope control, EEG analysis, HID, medical diagnosis, networking printers, security storage, transliteration, and video capture. I'm not going to read all the companies that he's consulted for over the years, but some highlights, you know, Dolby, Motorola, Roland, NASA. Yeah, he's got stuff on the space station. Yeah, that's okay. So the man who's going to take you into the space of debugging things in the wild, Devendra. Thank you um, and welcome. And it's an honor to be here again talking about debugging. So the topic I'm going to talk about is debugging in the wild. So here's the general, general plan. Uh, first, I'll talk about uh, the scope and limitations that we are going to deal with. Uh, then, bare minimum, what's needed to, to work in these situations. We'll set some debugging goals, and then we'll talk about some solutions on how we achieve these goals with some practical demos. Hopefully, these demos will work. Um, and then we'll talk about things to do beyond this talk. Uh, links to some resources and some tips on other platforms. And hopefully, if I do this quickly, we'll have time for questions. So, scope. Um, the scope we are talking about is when the problematic machine is not nearby. This may be an end user's machine, it may be a QA machine, it could be a machine in a remote office. Uh, essentially, it's not a developer's machine. Um, I run into this a lot. And so the question is, why not debug the problem on a development machine? Uh, this may be because of a, a number of reasons. Uh, maybe the problem only happens on certain specific systems, uh, only on a specific OS version, which you don't have, uh, specific hardware, specific CPU type, or, or a graphic uh, display. It may happen with some specific peripherals, or it could be it may require an elaborate setup, which is not practical for you to duplicate. Uh, sometimes the problem only happens after several hours of operation, uh, and it's impro impractical to reproduce the full environment there. Uh, or it may happen in the middle of the night. Uh, and basically, this only happens on systems which do not have de developer tools like an IDE uh, installed, because sometimes in just the fact that you install developer tools can change the behavior. Um, so what this means uh, in terms of limitations is you cannot put your source code or X code uh, on the system, uh, and you do not want to run a debug version, as running a debug version may change behavior. Uh, and you may not be able to provide a new version of the software with more instrumentation or logging. Uh, and of course, you have, to, you have to use tools which are pre-installed on the system. Uh, and it's possible to do remote debugging, but it may be difficult or impractical uh, due to firewalls or, or other difficulties. Um, uh, if we have time, we, we will discuss how to set up remote debugging, because that is also not clearly documented. Uh, but there are certain things you do need. So basically, you need a remote connection uh, via TeamViewer, screen sharing, VNC, Skype, any way that uh, allows you to work on the system. Uh, if not, at least you should have an ability to run a script that you can prepare and send to the user, and the user can send you back the results. Um, worst case, the user is on the phone. You can dictate the commands. The user can type the commands and tell you the response. This is definitely not recommended because there are a lot of room for errors. So, so let's talk about what sort of issues we can, we can debug. Uh, first set of issues are uh, performance issues. Uh, there may be sluggishness, uh, certain tasks that are consuming a lot of time, uh, audio artifacts or hangs. Uh, you may want to uh, detect memory issues like leaks, corruption, 
or you just want to understand memory usage patterns. Uh, you may also want to uh, diagnose behavior, bad behavior via some sort of a runtime inspection. Uh, you may want to figure out why a certain component is not loading or not loading correctly. Uh, the, the, the list here is not comprehensive. Uh, there are many other types of issues and many techniques that can be used uh, and tools are being improved regularly. So, okay, so let's start with performance. So the tools uh, that are pre-installed and which are available for us to use, uh, one of them is called Sample. It's a profiler. It profiles one process. The way it works is it wakes up periodically and captures the stack of all the threads on the target process. And then it provides a statistical uh, report of the call trees that it has accumulated. This is very similar to instruments. Uh, this can also be used to show uh, show the call stack during hangs. Uh, then there is a tool called filter call tree, which can prune the trees which are generated from, from the sample uh, tool, and it can remove clutter, which allows you to, uh, to, to look at the data uh, better. Uh, there is also a tool called spin dump, which is similar to sample, but spin dump will profile the, the entire system, uh, including the kernel, and of course, it has many more options to, to limit the captures or configure the captures. Uh, there is another tool called latency, which uh, using this, you can, you can see the scheduling and interrupt latency. Uh, this can be useful when working with uh, real-time performance issues, uh, with audio, with drivers, because uh, there may be situations in which you know your code is working fine, your part of the code is working fine, you can say it's not my fault, but the users don't care. So you still need to figure out what's going there. So we'll do a demo of using sample here. So okay, so I'm going to run an app, which was uh, it's a slightly contrived app, and uh, it's full of bugs, and so. If we do certain things, it does not perform well. So we'll see how well it's performing. We run the top tool, and this shows that full of bugs is using about 100% CPU. So let's figure out what's going on there. Okay, so we will. So here I'm running sample uh, on the application. I give it the application name, and I tell it which file to write the results to. So by default, if I don't give it any parameters, this will run for 10 seconds with uh, capturing the call stack every one millisecond. And once the 10 seconds are over, I will get a, a result in a file. So I can look at this file. And if you see, this gives some summary information. And then it gives the call graph, indicating uh, how many times uh, that particular call stack was encountered when it did a capture. As you can see, there is a lot of uh, operating system and framework code. And then uh, down here somewhere we have uh, uh, the code that we wrote. And so it, sh it shows some information, but it's got a lot of information that I may not really, uh, not really relevant. So what I can do is I can filter this using the filter call tree. Uh, so filter call tree, I tell it that uh, for all the system libraries, combine them into a single call, uh, but do keep the boundaries so we can see where it's our code and where it's the system code. And then it, you give it the name of the file that you want to filter and it will generate it. So we will run this and let's see what the result looks like. So if you look at it, now this looks much cleaner. There is, th because a lot of the operating system calls have been removed. And now we see we have a function called current color uh, right here. And, and then within current color, we have calls to reading files. We have calls that allocate memory. These seem to be taking a lot of time. Uh, very quickly, if we look at this code in Xcode, this is, OK. So this is the current color function right here. And in certain cases, it's, it's allocating memory. It's reading from files. And 
So we can see that obviously this is going to cause problems. So let's go back to the I'll just use this so it's out of the way. Okay. So uh, another set of problems uh, that we can look at are memory are using memory tools. So uh, macOS ships with a tool called Leaks. This is a clever tool that will search for unreferenced malloc buffers. Uh, since the malloc library keeps a list of all the buffers that have been allocated, this tool will search the entire uh, memory of the process and see if any other piece of memory is referencing this block. If you have a block that's been allocated but it's not been referenced, that means you cannot free it. And if you cannot free it, it assumes this is, this is a leak. Uh, keep in mind, this requires no instrumentation or, or measuring deltas of what the memory process state is, uh, or it doesn't require to, to close the application. It will report live leaks. Uh, there is another tool called malloc history, which will show you all the allocations that are made by a process during its lifetime. It does provide options where you can configure it to start recording only after a certain amount of memory has been allocated, so it doesn't contain too much extra data. Uh, or you can also tell it to charge system libraries, so you don't worry about the allocations made by system libraries. Uh, also, there are certain en environment variables that you can s set to make things easier uh, for you to look at results of leaks or malloc history. Uh, one is malloc strike logging. What this does is, if this is enabled, then for every allocation, the malloc library will also store the call stack. So this way, when you look at, uh, when you look at a block, you can see where that was allocated. Uh, you can use malloc guard edges. This will add guard pages before and after large allocations. So if you tend to read or write from these locations, it will uh, cause a crash. Uh, there, there are also ways to configure heap checking by specifying uh, when to start the heap checking and how often to check heap. Uh, and you can specify, uh, through malloc log file, you can specify where to store this information instead of writing it directly to the SDR. So let's take a look at running leaks. So I am going to run leaks on the full of bugs. And now this is showing me uh, Besides the summary, it shows me the address of each block that was uh, that was malloc, but it doesn't have any reference. The size, it shows the the zone from which it was allocated, and then it will show me some uh, some data, some initial data that it found at the block which has been leaked. Uh, but as you can see by itself, this is not very useful uh, because you cannot really tell where this was allocated. So we will try something else. So now here what I'm doing is I'm setting some environment variables, I'm enabling stock stack logging, and I'm telling it to write the, the information to specific file, and then I'll, I'll run the same thing again. Now the application is running, I'll perform some activities which I know cause memory, leaps, memory leaks, and once this is done, I will uh, run the leaks tool again. So again, I'm running uh, leaks uh, on full of bugs, and I'm doing a little bit of uh, translation of the output because by default, when you look at the, the stack that is stored, the functions are separated by pipe sign, which may be difficult to read, so I'm just replacing them with, with new lines here. And if you look at leaks, so now it shows me the, blocks, the block address. In addition to that, for each block that it has found has leaked, it shows me the, the call stack. So this way I can very easily find out uh, where that allocation was made which has not been deallocated. So, okay. So back to the presentation. Okay, in addition to looking at memory issues, we may want to do. Uh, we may want to inspect uh, inspect the state of our program, of what it is doing, uh, things like uh, 
you know, there may be a need for finding out what a program is doing during runtime. Uh, yes, logging is an option. You can add logs to your application and then examine the logs. But it requires the whole cycle of you modify the application, build it, deploy it, then run it, gather the logs. And let's face it, we can't think in advance of every loc location where we may need logs in, in, in the future. Uh, or it may become too excessive if we added every location. Uh, there may be a need to inspect parts of code which are not written by us. We may be using third-party libraries or frameworks, uh, which we cannot modify anyway. Uh, we may even need to inspect other programs' codes. For example, if you are writing a plugin, you may be running in a host, and you may need to, need to inspect uh, what's happening in the host. Or it may be another process like a background daemon on, in which you want to do some inspection. Sometimes the need is out of plain curiosity or maybe even mischief. You just want to figure out you know, how, how, what's going on there. Uh, more specifically, uh, we may need to know if a particular function is being called at all or not. Uh, we may need to know the parameters with which this function is being called and what is the return value. We may need to know how, how many times the function gets called. We may need to know the call stack for the function that is being called. Uh, which threads are invoking the function, uh, and this is also something we often need to know how much how much CPU time and how much wall clock time the uh, that particular function is consuming because the two may be different. Your code may be your function may be blocked on something, waiting for something, and you need to know that. So, how do we do that? We have something called dtrace. Um, we can do all the things that I listed in the last slide with dtrace. And the nice thing is we can do all of that without making a single change in our released application or other person's, others' applications. And it's available out of the box on Mac, Mac OS. The uh, dtrace system is completely baked into the Mac OS kernel. And the utility that you can use to, to perform operations is pre-installed on all Macs. So there is nothing for you to install. It does require root privileges to run. And on the newer OSs, it also requires system integrity protection to be disabled. Uh, uh, Xcode Instruments also uses dtrace internality, internally to do some of its magic. Uh, it's extremely powerful stuff. It's so powerful that some applications will not allow you to, to probe them. Uh, iTunes is one of them. Uh, you can also add this to your own applications if you don't want them to be probed by somebody else. Uh, this is some trivia. I'll just skip over this. Uh, the only interesting thing here is that about two months ago, Microsoft announced that Dtrace is also going to be available on Windows. So, so Dtrace is going to be there. OK, so let's talk about some details, some nuts and bolts. Uh, Dtrace uses its, its own D language script to describe what are called probes and actions. These tell what needs to be captured from where and what to do with the captured data. This is not the Walter Bright's uh, D language. Uh, the user mode part of Dtrace, the utility that Apple provides, this compiles these scripts to a bytecode and then ships it down to the kernel. And the kernel part actually does most of the magic. This may involve patching live code, but the kernel takes care of it. Uh, I can do a short introduction here about Dtrace. Dtrace is a very powerful and very flexible tool. So we'll, we'll just see some of it here. Now, the nice thing is that uh, macOS also ships with some pre-built Dtrace scripts. Uh, you don't need to write a line of code for this. You can just use them. I'll just uh, read out some of the sample uh, pre-built scripts that I find useful. Uh, there is a tool called OpenSnoop, which can tell you when a file is being opened from, from any application. Uh, this works system-wide. There is ExecSnoop, which will tell you whenever a new process is being executed. Uh, this is useful when you have those short-lived uh, processes which won't show in your process list or activity monitor. Uh, there is IO Snoop, which, which will tell you about IO events as they are occurring. There is IO Top, which this is a top-like utility, but specifically for disk IO. Uh, there is DTRUS, which will tell you 
the syscall, the system calls made by any process. Uh, it will tell you what the parameters are being uh, sent, what are the return values. Uh, there is error info which will, if any of the system calls are, are failing system wide, it will tell you uh, what the what the parameters were, parameters was were and which process was calling them. There is byte size dot d, which does more of an analysis and provides you statistical report on on how each process is using disk I/O. Uh, there's also last words. This is helpful in seeing what an application did just before it quit. It may be graceful or it may be a crash, so it tells you what happened just before the process went away. Uh, and of course, you can run apropos dtrace in terminal, and this will give you a list of all the dtrace scripts which are installed. Uh, the nice thing is, since all of these scripts they are provided the in the in the D language, you can look at them, you can modify them, tweak them, tweak them to your use if it's close to what you need but not quite. So you can tweak them and and then run them. So uh, I'll do a demo of running some of these pre-built scripts. So this is open snoop. And then it failed to initialize because it requires additional privileges. Remember, if you are going to snoop system wide, you can't be just any user. You need privileges. So I have a shell here, which I already started with privileges. And I will run this. So now this, uh, this is telling me which application you know, there is the spotlight, there is KXT. So I can see what's, uh, what's the user ID with which this application is running and which files are being opened system-wide. Um, we will, okay. And then there is exec snoop, which shows which applications are, are which are being executed. So if I'm running ls here, I see that I see ls was executed there. So this allows you to check what's going on uh, in a system-wide manner. Uh, okay. And then there is dtrace. Remember, dtrace tells me details about all the system calls being made by a process. So I'll just run dtrace on bash. And then I have bash running here. Again, I do an ls here. And here I see all the system calls that were made by ls. Uh, including the parameters. Uh, if there are strings, it will tell me what were the strings being passed. So back to the presentation. Now, uh, this is fine with using built-in script. What scripts, detail scripts, what if you want to write your own, uh, own scripts. So basically, uh, every detrace script is made up of three parts. There are probe descriptors, predicates, and actions. Um, a, pro a probe description specifies when to fire its corresponding action. So a uh, probe is a trigger for an action. You can have multiple probes in a script. So uh, there are different classes of probes which are available. These are called providers. And there are, uh, you know, there are just a handful of these uh, PID, uh, Objective-C, system call, IP for networking. There are DTraces owned probes. There are more than 70 types of probes which are available. Uh, we, are, we are only going to discuss PID uh, probes. Uh, predicates are conditions that you can specify along with a probe if you want to reduce or limit the amount of data you're gathering. It basically just tells you, OK, you triggered the probe, but I'm not interested because a certain condition was not true. Uh, and then there are actions. The actions are, uh, are C-like code that specifies what to do when a corresponding probe uh, got fired. Uh, different probes provide different arguments which you can use in the code you write. Uh, the the C-like code that you write, you can use variables. Some variables are provided by dtrace. Some uh, you can create your own, which can persist across different invocations of your probe. Uh, the variables that you provide can be global, they can be thread local, they can be probe clause local. Um, however, there is no control flow support. So you cannot do things like conditionals, ifs, or while, or loop. Uh, because keep in mind, all of this code has to be uh, compiled and sent down to the kernel for execution. So it needs to be as simple as possible. Uh, 
You can, however, use the ternary operator. So there is a little bit of uh, conditional available. And of course, you can use the predicates to conditionally disable executing any action at all. Uh, the script that you want, it can be specified on a command line if it's a simple script, or you can write it in a D file and then provide it to dtrace to compile and execute. Uh, you can look at the pre-built script to see how probes and actions are being used. Uh, there is extensive documentation available on dtrace. I have some links on the resources slide later on. And it's also possible if they, one of the existing providers do not provide what you need, you can also create your own static probe providers in your application, which can then later be used to write dtrace script. Uh, I will definitely not be getting into that today. So here's the, the syntax. If you want to write a PID provider, so there is PID and then you write PID and then you give the actual process ID of the, of the process that you want to uh, probe and examine. Then you give the module name. So module is the executable. It could be your executable or library name. Then the name of the function, and then which point you want to probe it from. You can probe it at entry, return, or anywhere in between. Um, so for example, I have a function called perform a leaky task. I just need to know whether this function is being called or not. So the, the probe provider would be PID and the ID, the PID of the, of the process. And uh, note that I can, I can the, the module and the function and the probe point, all of these are optional. So I can choose not to specify a module, and then it will try to match against all modules. And for the function name also, we can use the, the, the glob, uh, glob uh, characters like, uh, like star or question mark if you want to want uh, more global matching. Uh, so the, the first one, here, it will just tell me whenever a function which has a perform a leaky task in its name, whenever it's entered, it will tell me that this was invoked. The, the second example here, it will also be invoked, but it will execute certain actions, which I have here, which is basically it will print out the first argument of the function, and I print it out format as, as width because I know that's the argument. And then the, the u stack here, sorry, the, the u stack. Uh, call that I'm making here, it will print out the user mode call stack when this uh, probe was fired. Uh, the third example, return, it will just print the, it will be invoked when the function returns and will print out the return value. You can also gather some sort of statistics. You can find out how many times a function was called and when you gather this, this can also be organized by, uh, by certain categories. For example, you want to know how often a particular function is being called from different call stacks. So you can organize that also. And these are all one-liners. So let's try and execute these. Demo. OK, so here I'm, I'm executing that first liner, which will tell me when a particular function is being called. Notice that I did not specify uh, uh, an actual PID here. I am, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm using pgrep to get the PID of full of bugs, and that way uh, I don't need to worry about uh, finding out the PID. So I'll just run this. And it takes, uh, so here it says that this description, it has matched with one probe, and then when I do the corresponding action in my application, it says this function was called, if I do a resize, I get information that this function is being called quite often. So, so without making any change in the code in the release version of the application, I was able to add logging. Uh, and now we will do something more. So now this is the second example where I not only know when an application is being called, a uh, function is being called, I look at the parameter that was passed and the call stack. So let's run this. And so this tells me that this function was being called with a parameter of 10,000, and this is the call stack. Now if I do something else, we'll probably do with other one. So now it says this is essentially being called through the resize function. 
So, and what is the width being, the parameter being provided. Okay. And now we will, so now I, uh, it's a very similar thing, but I want to look at the return value. So I once again do the same thing and I, so this is returning a value of 1 and when I make this large, sometimes I get 0, sometimes 2, depending on what the function is doing here. Okay, so, and now I want to see, I know this function is being called, but I'm interested in knowing what was the call stack when this function was being called. So I use uh, another one-liner Dtrace script, and this tells me, okay, so, this tells me how often this function was being called from this call stack. So there was three times that I click, I did a double click, and the resize function was called 36 times. So this way I've gathered statistics about call counts, uh, which can also be very useful while debugging. Um, okay. So these were one-liners. Let's see if you want to do some something more detailed. We can write. Uh, uh, D file. So we'll take an example of a D file. Okay. So here it's a, it's a very similar uh, code here. There is PID, and then I have uh, uh, the the dollar one just says that use whatever was the parameter being passed from the command line. In this case, I know I'm going to pass the PID of the application, and now I'm uh, probing a function called current color at entry. I store the starting time. There are two timestamps I'm storing. And these, uh, when I use self, these become thread local variables. Uh, I'm storing the timestamp, which is like the wall clock time. And I'm storing, storing also V timestamp, which is the actual time being spent by this thread on the CPU. Uh, I'm storing both of these. And on return, I calculate by subtracting whatever the times are when the function returns. It tells me. It gives the, the result in nanoseconds, so I'm converting them to microseconds, and then I just print out how much time was taken. So let's try and run this. So here I'm running, again, dtrace. I gave the Q flag because I don't want it to tell me a lot of things. It will show things which I don't need to know, and then uh, as a parameter, again, I'm providing the PID of the function full of bugs, and then, so, so now, as you can see, it's telling me that this function was being called. It used uh, 9 uh, milliseconds of wall clock time and only 1.6 uh, milliseconds of CPU time, so obviously, I'm spending some time waiting here. In other cases, I'm spending a lot of time, CPU time as well as wall clock time. Let's briefly look at the code of current color. So basically what happens is if the width is higher, I'm doing a lot of work allocating memory. In other cases, I'm just waiting here. So that's why this indicates I'm taking less CPU time but more wall clock time. So, okay. so let's, okay. If you want to do other sorts of statistics analysis, you can also do that. So here is a very similar uh, script. Here I store the uh, store the V timestamp because in this case I'm not interested in in wall clock time, and I also uh, accumulate how many times this function is being called based on the stack. And then once I calculate the time taken, I also want to summarize. I want to know. Uh, know how many times how this function was called uh, total, how much total time was consumed. So I use the sum function, and I can also store minimum, maximum, and average uh, values. So this will automatically uh, accumulate these values and, and at the end give me the result. And here is uh, another uh, provider. This is the dtrace provider, and basically when I stop dtrace, when I press control C, this is going to fire. And this is going to just print the, the accumulations that I did earlier. 
So let's try this. So this one is not going to print anything while it is accumulating data because I didn't tell it to, but I can do certain things here and it keeps gathering the data in the background. And then when I press control C, it gives me the analysis. It says on an average, I spent 14 milliseconds. Minimum was one, maximum was 31 total count. And then this gives me bifurcation of how many times I was called from one call stack, how many times from other call stack. So this is fairly useful information. Okay. Okay, getting back to the presentation. Okay, now there are some considerations uh, when using dtrace. One is you need to run it as root. Uh, you need to have SIP disabled. Disabling SIP is not uh, straightforward, you have to boot into another partition and, and disable this. I have a link which shows how to do that. You can also Google it. Uh, using dtrace does add some CPU overhead. There is no official figure, but it's been experimentally found to be between one and two microseconds per, uh, per probe invocation, which is not very high. It may become high if it's being called too often or from a real-time thread that may impact the actual performance, but in most cases, this does not. Um, also keep in mind that some types of inspections are actually possible without needing dtrace. So you don't need to have SIP disabled for these. You know, these are things like LSOF, which will tell you, which will give you a list of all the open files in the system. There's TCP dump, which can capture uh, network traffic for you, which you can analyze. There is FS usage, which gives you information about file system usage. SC usage, which gives information about uh, system call usage, and th there are some others. The next thing we are going to talk about is issues with loading, loading, not loading. Uh, we may run into, into problems with applications or plugins which fail to load, and it can, this can happen due to a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, there may be missing or mismatched deployment, incorrect libraries or frameworks are present, or maybe the code needs expect certain environment variables which are not present. Uh, even worse, uh, when the application is trying to load, you install one version of the library, but it's actually loading from somewhere else, which is not something you want. So the, the dynamic linker, the, the dial D, uh, which does all this work, it has some environment variables which you can set, and this will give you information for example, with dial the print env, it will dump, whenever your application starts, it will dump the environment variables to stdair. Uh, you can tell it to print the names of all the libraries, the full paths of all the libraries which are actually being loaded. You can defer them if you, uh, to show only them after your uh, application has launched. Uh, sometimes uh, R paths in macOS can get uh, uh, complex and confusing, so this will print the R paths which are being used. Uh, it can also give you statistics to see how much time was spent in loading libraries. Uh, it can also print when initializers of specific libraries are being, uh, being called. Uh, it can also give you information about all the, uh, all the DILD related API calls such as DL open. Uh, and you can also use to, to provide your own library and framework search path uh, for these. So we'll do another demo. Okay, so here I am setting some environment variables to print the libraries, print environment variable, print statistics and then uh, writing to a specific file. And, and then I'm launching the same application. So the application is launched. And now I just need to see what happened there. So I can look at the file. It recorded this information. So first of all, you have here all the environment variables which were past, uh, which were present when the application was launched. And here it gives you a list of all the libraries which were loaded, including full path names, so you can figure out if this is the one that you needed. If there was a failure, it will also tell you it attempted to load this library. 
and it did not succeed. It also gives you information uh, about statistical information, total number of images that were loaded, uh, segments mapped, and then it gives you the actual amount of time it took to load specific libraries. So all of this information can be useful uh, in figuring out loading issues. Okay, so now uh, you know how to use these tools, but sometimes it's good to, to automate the use of these tools. Um, all the tools that I've discussed here can be run via a shell script or an Apple script. The output from these tools can be stored into files. So you can actually create scripts that will run the required tools, run it as root if required, set environment variables, store the result to files, and then pack them in a zip file and place them in a known location so the user can send them back to you. Uh, if what you can actually also do is you can convert any script into something that looks like an app uh, by simply placing your script in a folder hierarchy which has the name of the script dot app contents mac os and then you put the script in there and so the user does not need to be scared by with running something in the terminal and uh, so we'll see how uh, this can be done with a demo so uh, notice here I've already created this. So, so this is the name of the folder, run app, and then there is content, macOS, and then there's the actual script. Uh, nothing else is required. We'll just look at the script briefly. This is a shell script. It is preparing something in the slash DMP, and then it runs the tools that we talked about earlier with all the dial D printing. Uh, it does some OSA scripting to give nice message to the user, do something and press this button. And then it runs sample, filter call tree, leaks, and then it uh, stores all of this into a zip file which is placed on the desktop and it will just open the desktop on the finder. So let's see how this is done. So this uh, run diags will look like this. It looks like an app to the user. And when you run it, it actually launches the application and it says start the task that caused problems and then press continue. So I know it causes problems when I increase the size of the window and then I press continue. And now uh, this is running the sample tool in the background. It will take about 10 seconds and the other tools, which is storing information into files. And once it is done, it's going to pop up a message saying report has been saved to a file named diagsreport.zip on your desktop. You click got it and it opens the desktop and here's the file. And this is a file that the user can send it to you. If you open the file, you'll see the files which were used to with the, with the results and then you can use this to do your diagnosis. So to summarize, there are lots of debugging tools which are available pre-installed on all Mac OS systems which you can use. Uh, mo with most of them, you need to work on the command line. So you need to learn to use your keyboard. Don't be afraid. Uh, learn to use Bash. And there are a lot of other tools available which will help you to read and filter these text files. Uh, Dtrace is awesome. Uh, it's extremely powerful. You can use pre-built scripts or write your own custom scripts. It's very easy to write one-liner scripts to add simple logging. Uh, you, can pro you can create your own profilers if you want to profile your functions, you want to measure CPU usage, again, very quickly, gather statistics. Uh, you can write different probes which can be combined and create some very sophisticated tools. Uh, and of course, uh, try to automate the process by creating scripts, Apple scripts, are, and, and bundles out of these. So that's um, about it. Um, going beyond, so these are only some ideas to get you started. There are many other tools and many possibilities exist. You can use these in different combinations. Uh, if necessary, you, it's also easy to install developer tools on the target system. You, know, you just run any of these tools, such as LLDB, uh, on the machine and it will give you a message saying, do you want to install developer tools? And it will install developer tools. Uh, and once you install these, it also gives you access to a lot of other tools, such as 
an M tool which can be used to examine symbol names in a binary, uh, O tool for checking library dependencies, LLDB, LLDB server, and others. Um, uh, you can learn more about Dtrace. I have some links here. Uh, on other platforms, on Windows, they now have Dtrace available. Uh, there are also tools like the sysinternals tools. There's NTST, which is a command line debugger. Uh, very lightweight, very powerful. There's Xperf for doing profiling and, and performance analysis. UMDH for checking memory issues. Uh, there is also ETW, a tracing system, which, is, uh, which adds very low overhead. And on Linux also, there's tools like strace, uh, which is not quite like dtrace, but it gives you some uh, some capabilities of adding tracing, especially in the kernel. Uh, there are sysinternals tools from Microsoft being provided for, for Linux. Uh, it's, Dtrace is also available for Linux, but then you have to rebuild the kernel, or, or maybe some uh, distributions already have that. Um, and of course, there are many other tools. Uh, resources, the presentation, and all the related files, all the command lines that I used are all available on this link. You can read the man pages for the tools that I've described. They will uh, provide a lot of information about all the different options which are available there. Uh, the, and of course, if you learn, want to learn more about Dtrace, uh, there are tutorials. There are top 10 scripts that people use. Uh, there is a Dtrace guide on the Dtrace org. This is a, a comprehensive reference uh, guide which will give you all the details about syntaxes and what you can do, what you cannot do. If you need to disable SIP, there are articles that tell you how to do that. And the last one is uh, about uh, an article which which does did some experiments to in, to find out the the performance impact of using Dtrace. Uh, there is a very good Apple techno tech note on debugging techniques. This does not involve Dtrace, but it gives you a lot of other nice tips for debugging. Some of this is outdated, but mostly this is, st uh, this is still relevant today. Um, for debugging real-time audio, I did a lecture last year here, uh, which gives you different set of techniques, uh, specifically for uh, working with real-time audio. And there are WWDC videos for Mac uh, on working with Xcode and LLDB and to understand crashes and crash logs. So I think I completed on time. Let's give Devendra a big thank you for all that. Um, thanks, that was really good. Um, one thing, burning question for me would be uh, in terms of if you strip the symbols from your binary, um, how easy would it be to use, particularly Dtrace? Um, I'm thinking about when you're searching for the functions and stuff, how easy would that be to use? Okay, so that's, that's a very good question. Um, by default on Mac, when you build a release version, it will not remove the names uh, from the binary. But if you don't have the symbols, then obviously Dtrace can't look for uh, look for. So it's not about it will not contain the symbols by default when you build it. It your binary will contain the names and the corresponding addresses, but it will not contain other information such as uh, type information or or source code or line information. So so, but fortunately, since this is the way how most applications are built, this this works. But if you have uh, strip the symbol names explicitly by doing something more, then obviously this will not work. Uh, most of these tools, you know, uh, sample, uh, leaks, you know, anything that tries to look up uh, match names to addresses will fail to work. So with the, uh, the sample, would you not be able to simplicate it again if you've got a file to, you know, like if, if once you've stripped the, the symbols, you can have a simplicate file? so that you could simplicate again, is that possible? Yes, yes, that is possible. Yeah. So, so you will get the addresses and then you have to simplicate it yourself. Next question. Um, would, 
Uh, would the writing uh, detray scripts could could it be potentially dangerous because of all the root privileges? Could yes. Like, okay. Yes, it is. It is very dangerous. That's why on by default they disable it, right? Even if you are root, you cannot run a detray script. You have to disable SIP uh, in order to be able to use it. And uh, the other thing which I did not get into here is you can also write what are called destructive detray scripts in which in your action you can actually change the memory of the target process. So it can get extremely dangerous. Fortunately, if you are writing a script which modifies memory, a D-trace calls it a dangerous script, and you have to provide another command line flag to allow you to do that. But yeah, you can shoot yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. Or the user. Or the user. <laughs> Uh, is D-Trace uh, supporting iOS? OK. Yes and no. Uh, the D-Trace support is built into the iOS kernel, but Apple will not let you give you access to that. So they use it for their own tools, but it's not accessible to end users. Yes, yes, that's a very good point. You can use D-Trace in the simulator, in the iOS simulator. Hi. I just wondered if there's an equivalent of DYLD to, um, to, to print libraries, but for Linux? I am not familiar with that, uh, but I would assume there is, because this is a very basic, uh, basic thing. Last call. Any questions? Devendra, thank you once again. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think it's five o'clock up, up in control now. <laughs>